Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see, we all sat down at last to get started. Terrific. Good morning, my name is Mike Smith. I'm the Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology here on the West Side. It is my great pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker for this morning. Dr. Frank Nelson is a proud graduate of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where he uh, continued his training for internal medicine residency. Afterwards, he went to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for his gastroenterology fellowship, hepatology fellowship, and uh, since then has held a number of different positions working in academic and uh, community-based uh, care of uh, patients with digestive and liver diseases. He is an expert in, uh, in the treatment of liver disease and has a passion for the, uh, in, the evolving part of our field in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And he is going to talk to us about how that uh, impacts all of our practices, both within GI and in uh, internal medicine. So without uh, any further delay, Dr. Nelson, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that introduction. It's my pleasure to talk to you about this really exciting, actually really exciting topic. Hepatology is actually a hot topic um, now that we've uh, got Hep C into uh, almost uh, internist uh, uh, management. Um, so let's let's I'll tell you a little bit what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology. Talk a little bit about the pathogenesis. We'll spend some time talking about how we make the diagnosis. And I want to finish up talking about some management options uh, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But we'll start with some definitions. So what exactly is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Really, it's any person who has more than 5% of the hepatic parenchyma occupied by fat. And that's assuming that there's a lack of other secondary causes of hepatic fat accumulation. These patients are not drinking. These patients are not on steatogenic medications. They don't have any hereditary disorders, such as Wilson's disease, which also can present as fat. They don't have viral hepatitis. Hepatitis C is also associated with fat accumulation in the liver. So patients without any secondary cause for hepatic fat accumulation with more than 5% of fat in the parenchyma have, by definition, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. NASH, on the other hand, is the presence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but with evidence of inflammation and cell injury. And there's a whole spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease going from asymptomatic patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to patients who actually have uh, cirrhosis. So <clears throat> why is this important? Well, certainly there is a huge um, global uh, burden of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's estimated that between 20 and 30 percent of, of the population of the Western world has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and about 5 to 18% in Asia. And the prevalence is increasing with the current trends in dietary irresponsibility and sedentary lifestyle. Additionally, there appears to be a linear rise along with the so-called metabolic syndrome. Looking at specific populations, here's a study from India uh, where they looked at healthy subjects just by liver ultrasonography. And these patients are picked up simply by doing an ultrasound. The patient has an echogenic liver, said to be fatty liver, and they found rates somewhere between 16 and 32 percent. And if you extrapolate this to the entire Indian population, in India alone, there are about 25 million patients who have non alcoholic fatty liver disease and are at risk for the complications that arise from it. Turning, turning to uh, Another worldwide study, there's another meta-analysis that looked at, at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease diagnosed again by imaging, simple, simple ultrasound, and was found that the highest prevalence of this disease was found in the Middle East and in South America, but for reasons that we'll talk about later, the lowest prevalence was found in Africa. The NHANES data, looking at over a 20-year period from 1988 to 2008, showed that the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has increased from about 5% to 11% over a 20-year period. And this, again, was concurrent with the increased prevalence of the metabolic syndrome. So what are the comorbidities that are associated with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? 
certainly obesity, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension, most of which make up the metabolic syndrome, which is actually present in over 40% of patients that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And again, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is not only increasing in adults, but we see it in, in our pediatric population. It is the most common hepatic abnormality in kids aged between the ages of 2 and 19. Um, and it is on track to be the most common indication for liver transplantation by 2020. Folks, that's next year. Um, what's the economic burden and how and why is this important? Because in the United States, according to the, looking at Medicare data, there are about 64 million people that have this abnormality, with a potential cost of about 103 billion because of the associated comorbidities, most from the metabolic syndrome. In Europe, this number is about $35 billion. And if you look at those people that only have NASH, so those are not people with just non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but actually have active inflammation and are progressing towards cirrhosis, the cost is between $10 and $15 billion uh, a year. So why is NAPLD important? Because it leads to NASH. NASH is the underlying cause of progressive fibrosis resulting from necroinflammation. It's the leading cause of liver disease in developed countries, affecting about 66% of obese people. Sorry. 66% of obese people, obese people and diabetics over the age of 50. And what's interesting about NASH, it's not so, not so that they're all dying because of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but the number one cause of death in these patients is actually uh, consequences of metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. Also, the increase in the occurrence of malignancies. So, why, again, where do we focus in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Well, there are several stages of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease where the disease is reversible. When you go from a healthy liver to having a steatotic liver, you can intervene. When going from steatosis even to NASH, you can intervene. And we're going to talk about several strategies to intervene in these patients. What you want to do is prevent them from coming to the last stage where they go from NASH to actual cirrhosis. As we know, cirrhosis is not uh, reversible. So we tend, we tend to want to intervene earlier. Again, another slide looking looking at the uh, not all, talking about um, the consequences of NAPLD in patients. The primary problem being cardiovascular disease, and if you look there, it also increases your rates of infection. Um, it obviously leads to cirrhosis and patients having to have liver transplantation. And the issue with liver transplantation is people with BMIs more than uh, 40, uh, with class 3 uh, obesity, are relative contraindications of transplantation. Their post-transplant complications are much higher than the regular population. Again, you see hepatocellular carcinoma as 1%. However, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is actually the third most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in the United States presently, and is increasing by approximately 9% uh, per year. So it's very important. The chart on the right shows you the rates, the patients waiting for liver transplantation from hepatitis C, hepatitis C uh, mixed with alcoholic liver disease, and alcoholic liver disease. And what's important about that chart, if you look, most of those rates have stayed relatively stable. But if you look at the line for uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis between 2004 and 2013, it has increased by 170%. So looking at clinical conditions that are associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we mentioned cardiovascular disease, obstructive sleep apnea, which we'll talk about again in a couple of slides, um, diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome because of the obesity, the hyperandrogenemia, and insulin resistance associated with it. Um, their patients have elevated ferritins, um, hypothyroidism more as a cause, more than a, as a result of it. And pancreatic steatosis is also been associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there is a strong link between met the metabolic syndrome and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and insulin resistance. As you know, the metabolic syndrome is a conglomerate of cardiovascular factors 
which predispose a person to developing type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So when you compare diabetic patients matched for age, sex, uh, weight, um, they have fat, liver fat contents that are 80% higher than the general population. And what's the other interesting thing about type 2 diabetics is they can actually have normal liver enzymes and still have fatty liver disease. So that suggests that we can underestimate the amount of fatty liver disease in this particular population. Um, gender has a, plays a role. Um, it is believed that it is more that there's a greater preponderance in males, but if you look at postmenopausal females, the rate tends to rise after menopause uh, in females for reasons that are not exactly quite clear. Um, the, ge genetics play a role. If you look, <clears throat> especially in our population in St. Luke's and maybe a little bit of West, we have a large Hispanic population. And Hispanics tend to have a higher occurrence of steatohepatitis hepatitis cirrhosis and advanced fatty liver disease. And this is because of genetics. There is a, uh, a patatin-like phospholipase domain. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, also known as PNPLA3. It's an allele which predisposes them to accumulate fat at a higher rate, to develop inflammation at a higher rate, um, even when they're not diabetic, they don't have insulin resistance, they are not obese. Um, smoking has been found to be an independent risk factor for developing non alcoholic fatty liver disease, and obviously, excess alcohol intake is not, uh, is not actually a cause for, for fatty, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, but it is a risk factor for developing uh, fatty liver disease. Now, a very, very, very busy slide which I'm going to try to go through uh, 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 rather slowly. So this is a consolidated NASH pathogenesis slide, integrating obesity, uh, insulin resistance with bile acid metabolism, lipotoxicity, endoplasmic particular stress, which results from that, apoptosis, hepatic, hepatic progenitor cell transformation, and stellate cell activation, which all results in hepatic steatosis, necroinflammation, and fibrosis. Um, as you can see on the on the left side of the chart, the genetic influence, the PNPLA3 allele that I talked about earlier, has an influence on uh, lipid metabolism and increases lipotoxicity. Uh, there is the gut, not only do bile acids play a role, but the gut microbiota has been recognized as one of the key players in the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Gut microbiota not only influence the absorption and disposal of nutrients for the liver, but also conditions hepatic inflammation by supplying these toll like receptor ligands, which can stimulate cells to produce inflammatory cytokines. And so, accordingly, the modification of intestinal bacterial flora has, with specific antibiotics that composes one of the therapeutic approaches uh, to the treatment of liver disease. But let's put it a little bit more simply. This so called, when you look at the pathogenesis, it's much easier to understand the so called two hit, um, two -hit um, methodology for development of, of non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it begin, the first hit begins with insulin resistance and the accumulation of fat within the liver. <clears throat> when the, there's accumulation of fat in the liver, it's actually toxic to the liver. There's increased hepatic triglycerides, so consistent more fat accumulation. Fat is actually toxic, toxic once it reaches a certain level. This induces oxidative stress, you get inflammation, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, you have endoplasmic reticulum stress. As a consequence, you have Kupfer cell activation, stellate cell activation, apoptosis, and this leads to fibrosis and eventually leads to cirrhosis. So there's a whole spectrum. How do we make the diagnosis of, of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Well, you have to have a clinical suspicion. So patients who have, who have a family history of the metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, uh, they have to be people who take less than 20 grams a day of alcohol if they're women, less than 30 grams a day if they're men, because if they have heavy alcohol use, obviously no longer non-alcoholic. Um, patients with, with central obesity, the absence of any type of viral infection, usually elevated liver enzymes, they're not taking steatogenic drugs, uh, have, insulin, uh, uh, have insulin resistance, have hyperlipidemia, 
um, all our candidates for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The simplest thing to do is an ultrasound. That's what most patients get, and a lot of the patients referred to us simply have ultrasounds for other reasons and are found to have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But in looking at that, you also have to, to rule out other causes. For example, most of the patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease will have an associated increased ferritin. Doesn't mean they all have hemochromatosis, but of course you have to rule out genetic hemochromatosis as a cause. You also have to look out for other causes, celiac disease, thyroid disease, which can affect lipid metabolism and also result in fatty liver disease. We mentioned polycystic ovarian disease earlier, Wilson's disease, all of these can also present with increased fat in the liver. So if you have a patient who has hepatic steatosis detected on imaging, and signs attributable to liver disease, elevated liver enzymes, etc., that person should be worked up for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, if you have a patient who has incidental hepatic steatosis with no signs of liver disease, then that person should probably be evaluated with some metabolic risk factors or some alternate cause of hepatic steatosis, such as alcohol or steatogenic medication. So, what are the tools that we use? Generally, liver enzymes are not very reliable for making the diagnosis. Um, almost of the easiest test is an ultrasound. However, um, ultrasound, while it can pick up fat, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have the ability to pick up uh, fibrosis. Um, CT can be better in larger patients as it is difficult to get a good ultrasound examinations in very obese patients. However, MRI and uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy are much better uh, in terms of measuring total liver fat. However, the gold standard, of course, is always a liver biopsy. Liver biopsies rarely need to be done in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease unless you're looking to treat the patient, or if you're trying to stage the patient, or the patient has some other comorbidity um, that would require medication that may affect uh, may increase the amount of fat in the liver trying to avoid that. So, if you've sent a patient to one of us, um, the patient has uh, more than likely had a fibro scan. Um, and this is what we use to diagnose patients with hepatic steatosis. Fibro scan is based on vibration control transient elastography. Um, it measures quantitative, two qualitative parameters liver stiffness, you get uh, an F score, and you get, a, you get a CAP score, which actually looks at the amount of fat in the liver. It's actually fairly accurate um, uh, for uh, quantitating the amount of fat in the liver. There are also uh, blood tests that we do. We've sort of gone away from it. This with the so called FIT4 index, which is a blood test based on platelets, the age of the patient, AOT, and the AST, which can give you a pretty good predictor of whether or not there's fibrosis. There's also a NAFLD fibrosis score. Um, there's a fibro lead in the fibro score, all tests that you can get from lab core. Um, however, the most accurate method for detecting fat in the liver these days is really um, a well done uh, fibro scan. Again, the role of liver biopsy, really not important in most patients unless you go, go into a clinical trial, you want to initiate drug therapy or you just want to assess, assess the prognosis at that time. Also, if there is any confusion about what exact what disease exactly is there, a liver biopsy will be very helpful because you can have isolated steatosis as seen in the slide on the left, where there's actually, you don't see any inflammatory cells, there's no inflammation whatsoever, to steatohepatitis in the slide on the right. And the first panel that you see um, simply has steatosis, uh, with a lot of inflammatory cells, which gives you steatic hepatitis. And on the right, you can actually see that there is some uh, lobular fibrosis. What are the histologic features? I put this only up to show you that there is a difference in the presentation and in liver biopsies in adults versus children. Uh, in children, the disease tends to be one that surrounds the portal areas, whereas in adults, the fibrosis tends to be uh, in the sinusoid or actually in zone 3. Of the liver. The most important thing uh, that we're going to talk about this morning really is uh, management and how does one manage these patients. So, so um, the most 
probably the most important management uh, that is actually not on the slide, and that's of lifestyle modification and exercise, as well as surgical interventions, which uh, we'll come to in more detail in a minute. Um, but there are several pathways available in the treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. First, targeting fat accumulation, drugs such as ketoglitazone or elafibrinor, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, bile acid, farcinoate receptors, um, abetacolic acid, uh, drugs that inhibit de novo uh, lipogenesis within the liver, such as glutide, and fibro fibroblast growth factor analogs. Second uh, target would be oxidative stress alleviation through the use of antioxidants, whereby the heat comes in and pentoxiflin, uh, emrocasin, and some immune modulations, which we'll talk about in more detail in a minute. And third, third target is anti-obesity medications such as Orlistat uh, and uh, finally antifibrotics, uh, which uh, work at the end stage of the disease trying to reverse uh, some of the fibrosis that occurs. So we're, we're, when do we start treatment? Well, early in NAFLD, um, the most important thing is introducing lifestyle and dietary uh, changes. Um, and in the next slide, we'll see why that's so important. As the patient progresses in the amount of, or the degree of NASH, then um, you considerations such as bariatric surgery um, and pharmacotherapy uh, are initiated. But early in the disease, really, even though most patients will come with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you get a consultation, and the first thing that comes back is diet, life, patient needs to lose weight, patients put less fat in their diet, actually is the most effective uh, way to reverse it before uh, fibrosis sets in. So again, to emphasize that again, body weight, increased physical activity, and also bariatric surgery, or even endoscopic weight loss surgery, which is uh, becoming much more popular, uh, can be effective in obese patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There is currently no approved pharmacotherapy um, while there's lots of data with vitamin E and pioglitazone, it's not FDA approved for non-alcohol uh, fatty liver disease. Um, but ha these two drugs have the most evidence. Um, and really, you have to tailor your treatment for patients with non-alcohol fatty liver disease based on their unique situations. So why was weight loss so important? So multiple studies looking at patients who have non-alcohol fatty liver disease all the way up to to early cirrhosis and looking at the results of weight loss. If you can get a patient to lose at least 10% of their current body weight, there have been studies showing up to 45% of those patients will have regression of fibrosis. And even smaller amounts of weight loss have an effect on the natural history of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So what you want to do is you actually want to prevent the progression of this disease onto cirrhosis. So Dieting and weight loss, as you can see, plays a major role, with even a 3% weight loss reducing the amount of steatosis, 5% reducing the amount of bulimia, which tells you you're affecting actually in inflammation, 7% um, getting complete resolution of NASH, and if you can go more than 10%, you can actually get some remission of fibrosis. So weight loss cannot be emphasized more, given that there is really no FDA-approved medication. There are several Therapies that are that are in the pipeline and some that we use already are insulin sensitizers, um, uh, antioxidants, anti-apoptotics, um, uh, antifibrotics, insulin sensitizing agents, probiotics. Um, probiotics are playing a major role now that we understand the interaction between the gut microbiome and the um, risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We'll talk about a little bit about each of these in the following slides. Um, vitamin E, uh, which uh, a lot of people have used to treat patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, has been shown in animal models to be an antioxidant, it modulates cell signaling and prevent damage caused by free radicals. So the largest trial, the Pittman's trial, which compared pioglitazone, vitamin E, and placebo in uh, in, in non-diabetic patients found that there was significant improvement compared with placebo in steatosis, lobular inflammation, and ballooning. Uh, 
um, when patients were given 800 units of uh, vitamin E over a period of 96 weeks. Uh, this patients also showed improvement in ALT with some resolution of NASH in about a third of the patients. Um, however, um, it did reach statistical significance, and most, most importantly, what we're really trying to invent, prevent at the end, which is fibrosis, there was really no improvement in fibrosis. In the tonic trial, where vitamin E was compared with, to met, compared with metformin and placebo in pediatric patients, again, there was some improvement in inflammation and in mass scores, but there was no real resolution of NASH. Um, serum ALT and hepatic fibrosis didn't meet, even meet the uh, primary endpoint of 50% improvement. So while there is some positive data with vitamin E, there is also some data that shows it may not be doing very much at all. And although it's well tolerated, there was a small uh, increase in mortality in these studies. Um, others have associated with the increased risk of prostate cancer and hemorrhagic stroke. And so therefore, given the side effects with vitamin E, it should be tailored towards individuals who really have histologically proven NASH, and these patients have to be made aware of the possible side effects associated uh, with the use of vitamin E. Uh, in the treatment of diabetes. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, milk thistle. Everybody wants to use milk thistle. We use it for mushroom poisoning. Um, there are there has been uh, really um, not much uh, not much in the way of uh, controlled trials that have shown any benefit for it. Um, a randomized trial for its use in NASH was performed where milk thistle was used with vitamin E. Um, there is really no improvement in the uh, serum markers, and it's unclear. And the the bit of uh, improvement that was seen, it's not clear whether it came from the vitamin E or really from the milk thistle. So the jury's really out on whether it actually uh, provides any benefit. So what about coffee drinking? So coffee is said to be, you know, if you listen to the popular media, coffee every day is good for you one day, bad for you the next day, but it's associated with the in the with a decreased risk of cirrhosis and hepatitis type carcinoma in some studies. And it's thought to be because of these phenolic and chlorogenic acids that are in there. But to date, there have been no randomized controlled trials on the effects of NAPLs. Um, so you can tell your patients that uh, drinking coffee may or may not have an effect on their fatty liver disease despite the drinking coffee in the evening. We talked uh, earlier about the gut microbiome, which uh, clearly plays a role in obesity and development of metabolic syndrome. There have been some studies, and actually there are many more studies in the pipeline, that evaluate uh, non-invasive measures of steatosis in their relationship to the administration of probiotics. But it's unclear uh, whether using this intervention with probiotics has any real effect on the fatty liver disease. Um, what about metformin, which has been around for a long time? There are a lot of studies that have been done with metformin, but it has really not shown um, any significant change in hepatic steatosis, balloon, it really doesn't seem to do anything for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And currently, the guidelines are recommend against uh, using metformin in the treatment of this disease. Um, current guide, clinical guidelines recommend, I'm sorry, the TIDE trial actually used metformin and found it not to be superior to placebo. Again, um, a reason not to uh, use metformin in these patients. We tend to use metformin off-label for weight loss. And the weight loss that's associated with metformin may be the only improvement uh, that these patients experience from the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Again, insulin sensitizers. So, if, in addition to improving insulin sensitivity um, and adiponectin production, these lead to an increase in the uptake of fatty acids, and they actually help uh, fatty acid uh, uh, synthesis thus potentially take, drawing fat away from the liver, putting fat away in, in muscle tissue. Uh, the longest, uh, the largest randomized trial, that, again, the Pippins trial, looked at 30 milligrams a day uh, uh, of theoglutazone for 96 weeks. And as with vitamin E, there, there was improvements in steatosis and lobular cellular inflammation and ballooning. Um, the NAPLS activity score improved, um, and insulin resistance all met statistical significance. So there was some evidence for some efficacy in insulin sensitizers. Um, the resolution of definite NASH was also significant in 47% of the patients. Um, however, there was no real change in hepatic fibrosis. One would think that if NASH was improved, that eventually 
fibrosis will decrease by 10 percent shown uh, in this particular study. And of course, there are more side effects in people uh, giving pioglitazone uh, compared to those with vitamin D. And of course, you can't use pioglitazone in patients who don't have uh, insulin resistance. Uh, oral stat, which is used basically for a weight loss, um, was shown to decrease ALT and some graphic hepatic steatosis, but really failed to show any real change uh, in histology. And toxiflin, which is uh, an antioxidant by way of its attenuating TNF, um, has been studied as a possible treatment. However, two randomized controlled trials, one showed a little bit of improvement, one didn't show any difference. Um, however, it was associated with a significant uh, GI side effects, mostly in the form of nausea. Uh, Ursodeoxycholic acid, uh, used in patients with cholestatic liver disease, also been studied but did not show any difference in patients. Statins, while they're safe and can be used in patients with elevated liver tests, and also in patients with uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, don't really show much of a benefit. Um, there are two prospective randomized studies used in statins and treatment of NASH, and a meta analysis of these findings shows a decrease in AOT. Uh, and your sonograms look better, but liver histology was not assessed, so it's not really clear if they play a role. Um, and they are clearly beneficial for persons at risk for cardiovascular disease and should be used even in patients who have elevated liver tests, for which they often get uh, consults. So, what are the algorithm for the current treatment options in NASH? Um, well, lifestyle modification, combination of diet and exercise with a goal of weight loss between 7 and 10%. If the patient is obese, you really should consider bariatric surgery or endoscopic intervention. Uh, or the step for weight loss, it could be helpful. If the patient is not obese, you have to assess their other metabolic risk factors. If they're insulin resistant, perhaps a trial of pioglitazone, trial of vitamin E, um, uh, or enrollment in uh, clinical trials, as, as there is really no FDA-approved uh, treatment for this disease. And again, you have to warn the patients of the possible side effects of vitamin E. Obviously, if you're going to use pioglitazone, you might have some evidence of insulin resistance. So these agents should be individualized to, to uh, the individual patient. And you have to really counsel these patients uh, about these treatments as they are off-label. Uh, however, this just shows that there's really this is an open field for research. Um, and we really need uh, additional drugs to try to treat this disease. With that in mind, there are several drugs in the pipeline um, for this disease. Um, there are up, up to phase three trials using methylcholic acid, elefabrinor, which is an agonist of the peroxisome proliferator actor pathway, the so-called PPAR, um, is in phase three studies. Um, immune modulators, Senarikovic, uh, I can never pronounce that. Which is immune modulated is in phase three trials and is showing some promise. Semaglutide, which acts like a human, it's a human uh, glucagon like peptide, which increases insulin secretion, is also in several studies. Um, the, the, just to show you how rapidly things change, Selonstratip uh, was in phase four trials and actually. Uh, has uh, the data has was recently published and it actually shows that it's no better than placebo. It was actually off uh, in my next slide. I have to be removed. So, what are targets for some upcoming therapies uh, uh, for non alcoholic states? Yeah, with the tightest. Well, there, you look at the different phases of uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And in the stage of steatosis, as we mentioned earlier, really the most important thing is diet exercise and prevention of fat accumulation. But then you can aim it at reducing oxidative stress. We talked about vitamin E. Um, the, the, then you can uh, target fibrosis and or hepatocellular carcinoma, which is all the way at the end. That's actually what you try to present, try to prevent. You can work on the gut, looking uh, at the microbiome, and we use probiotics. Uh, there are, are early studies data is not conclusive at this point. So I think we'll look more specifically at some drugs that do have, uh, have demonstrated some um, 
um, serolidazole, acolic acid, elafibrinor, and nilaglutide have demonstrated variable beneficial effects on NASH and histology in some phase two randomized control trials, which we'll look at in just a minute. One year midterm interim analysis of this immunomodulator, um, which is showing some promise. Um, as I mentioned before, selenocertib is no longer uh, uh, viable as the final data that recently came out not yet be placebo. Uh, I said, why is this important? Well, it's important really because of what you see in the middle. So to decrease inflammatory cytokines. If you're decreasing inflammatory the result of that is decreased stellate cell activation. So you're going to have uh, decreased uh, laying down of fibrous tissue. Uh, so that leads to decreased fibrogenesis and matrix degradation, which really is what happens when you reverse fibrosis. Uh, the PPAR agonists. Um, for elafibrinor, which is a dual alpha and gamma uh, uh, TPAR agonist, um, for the reasons uh, listed here, there is lots of data in the metabolic syndrome and there's emerging data in non alcoholic steatic hepatitis. So, what is serolidazole? Potent PPAR alpha and uh, PPAR uh, where did it come from? It's a combination of two drugs, phenylcarbonyl um, but it has a tendency to increase the ALT a little bit, and pioglitazone, which is a PPAR gamma, which tends to uh, uh, decrease your insulin resistance, decrease the ALT. The combination of these two drugs, serolidazole, which people Activities of both um, decreasing triglycerides um, and uh, the combination of insulin sensitivity, um, a good drug to try in patients with disease. Because again, you're decreasing triglycerides, LDL, you're decreasing, uh, improving insulin sensitivity, and you're decreasing the ALT. And when used in initial trials, they found that this, this combination drug leads to no significant weight gain, patients don't have edema. Needing hypoglycemic episodes, at least in the early trials. And why is it, and again, going back to a slide that we looked earlier, why is this an ideal agent for NASH? What decreases hepatic triglyceride synthesis and reduces hepatic fat accumulation, which actually decreases and decreases the ability to develop um, mycotoxicity, it decreases mitochondrial dysfunction. Which again leads to decreased buffer cell activation, all those things that lead to development of cirrhosis. Um, extract from diesel from last year, uh, there were uh, these are complete, these are completed or actually not all completed trials of serolidazole in patients with NAC. Look at the data from uh, the initial studies. You see that with serolidazole, total cholesterol was reduced, non HDL cholesterol was reduced, the ALT was reduced, um, and the AST. Not, uh, there, there was, this was a, they also went similar to pedoglitazone, but for reasons we're going to see in a minute, it actually is, is a better drug to use. That model looking at serolidazole given to uh, rats uh, with uh, uh, induced uh, fatty liver. Look at the sterile glimpses our slide, which is the second one from the top. Looking first on the left, you'll see that given this drug, there tends to be less fat accumulation in the liver. And if you look at the slides on the right, which is actually looking at uh, it's a red oil stain, actually, actual fat accumulation. Once these rats are treated, um, there is much less in the liver. So the conclusion from that was that. Um, that, uh, that sarah glitazone inhibits steatosis, inflammation in ballooning, addition to lowering body weight and serum uh, LFTs and lipids. It ameliorated development of NASH um, and uh, an endpoint. Um, what about humans? So 
the stick as this one, so it's just fine. So it's just another mouse model. So in clinical, in terms of clinical studies, which is really sort of the fair bit child of Nile Hall and Bill disease treatment these days, um, there are phase, phase one randomized control trials in healthy volunteers. There are currently phase two randomized control trials. There are phase three for um, it's being used for each and there are two randomized control trials uh, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. When looked at, sorry, uh, when looked at in terms of the clinical, um, there's, there's uh, the phase two trial in patients with national improvement in liver enzymes. Lipids. Um, there are one. The end of the primary endpoints for looking at a change in AOT from week six to twelve, and their secondary endpoints for looking at sustained reduction in AOT and changes of, of C uh, peptide, which is a polymerase and resistance, um, and some exploratory endpoints if the change in lipid levels were assessed at the end of the trial. The effect of reducing the liver enzymes in patients with biopsy proved a match in the phase two trial. The absolute change in this slide in the AOT in week 12 um, was significant. Um, and then uh, another randomized control phase done in India, which is a multi center double blind trial looking at steroid glitazar 4 milligrams versus placebo for uh, 52 weeks. And this was the efficacy of this drug in NASH patients. Uh, the primary endpoint is to assess the decrease in, in the NAPLD activity score. And of course, there were several secondary endpoints. After, at the end of this trial, there was a significant reduction in triglycerides, liver, and the uh, transaminases uh, improved significantly. Another clinical trial looking at sarabutazar along with another drug, uh, which was an insulin sensitizer, and looking at the decrease in HDL, triglycerides, and liver fat content. And they were all significantly reduced with this particular drug. <clears throat> trial looking at patients in India, <clears throat> looking at the safety of this long-term data in patients with the metabolic syndrome actually using sarolidazar over a two-year period. There was a 41% reduction in triglycerides, 12% reduction in LDL, uh, reduction in total cholesterol, 28% reduction in HDL, hemoglobin A1C was improved, Renal, hepatic, and cardiac functions were monitored every three months, and they tend to be adverse effects. No significant bleeding, um, during the whole two-year follow-up. So it has long-term glycemic and lipid control profile. Um, in the PRESS trial, again, using seroglutazar, triglycerides were lower, and you saw sort of the same sort of reduction in these, in these, um, parameters that contribute to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Sour livers are found to be safe. Most common side effects were really GI side effects, gastritis, dyspepsia, um, <clears throat> um, asthenia, all mild to moderate, and no one really had to stop the study. So, sour livers are, is a really important for the management of both NAPL and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It shows a strong lipid lowering effect, uh, reduces uh, NASH markers significantly. Histology, which is actually what you want to do because it can improve histology, you can prevent cirrhosis and prevent uh, the development of morbidities such as cellular uh, carcinoma, the need for liver transplant. So it showed overall improvement. So let's look at PPAR agonists. Uh, Illofibrinor, which I mentioned earlier, uh, in uh, 
early studies with L-Ethiridinor, uh, the alkaline phosphatase, which often is increased along with the GGT when there's in the liver, such as uh, addict steatosis, numbers were much improved, and looking, <coughs> uh, the effects were consistent in all phase of uh, two. Um, it seemed compared to pioglitazone, it also tends to uh, in deep Solution of not of NASH. Um, again, looking at Nomis Victoza, it's a GLP analog, um, which suppresses glucagon and tends to stimulate uh, insulin release. This drug is also being used in the mean trial that was used to see what it could do to improve non alcoholic hepatitis. Um, and as you can see uh, in the early trials, the reduction in NASH was significant, up to about 30 improved mosquitosis. Um, there was zero fibrosis worsening. There was an improvement in ballooning. Um, and improved. So there is some evidence that this may be also a potential tool in the treatment of non-alcoholic uh, liver disease. So to try to summarize some of the interventions, um, in non alcoholic liver diseases, lifestyle modification, diet and exercise. We saw the earlier slide that the more weight that you lose, you get uh, your effect on the advancement from non alcoholic fatty liver disease to hepatitis and ultimately cirrhosis. Um, vitamin E uh, can be used, but again, uh, of cardiovascular events and also risk. Of uh, other toxicities of vitamin E from associated with some of the statins are important because they improve this dyslipidemia uh, to these patients, but don't uh, in uh, changing the natural history of the model of fatty liver disease. Talk about metformin, metformin does not have a role. PPAR agonists seem to clinical trials and probably will become. Very soon, in terms of uh, efficacy, beta choline acid is still in clinical trials, um, as well as uh, glucagon uh, for the treatment of bariatric surgery. Is at the end probably I should have listed under lifestyle modification, but it also plays a role because when you uh, have bariatric surgery, their lipid profile gets better than insulin. And they actually wind up uh, reducing uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. To summarize, NASH can progress to cirrhosis and liver cancer and has become a leader. It is up to become the number one reason for liver transplantation in the United States. Um, it is a global epidemic. Vitamin E and pioglitazone uh, remain the first line off label drugs for NASH. While there are many things in the pipeline, there is nothing in pioglitazone and vitamin E are not FDA approved but can be used off label. There's the most data with these two drugs. Um, of the emerging compounds, serolidazar seems to be the most promising. Folic acid and L-ethribrinor, the PPAR agonist, the dorolutide, also known as Victoza. There is some evidence in these two randomized controlled trials of variable benefit on the effects of NASH histology. So just uh, keep your ears open for uh, the end of these trials and the uh, final data. But for all these promising stages of development, establishment of long term safety. Key for the therapies um, for patients with uh, non alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. Thank you. Mr. Ryan, uh, <laughs> uh, this, this disorder, I had not realized how frequent it was. There's some other things here that uh, I'm concerned about because that's what's changing, and you, you're going to tell us why the frequency is lower in Africa. But uh, I, we 
we're talking about diet, 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 but it's very complex. One of the major things is this I call a flood of fructose. And what is its impact on the system? Because it seems to me to metabolize it very well. And it's extremely common in everything. And reading labels, you see that, uh, that that's one thing. The other is the carbon size in our environment. Our berries are considered to be very healthy, heart healthy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But strawberries have the highest concentration of pesticides. So if you buy organic strawberries, uh, it's you know two or three times the same price to do. And when strawberries are quote on sale, it's hard not to consider buying it, but the pesticide content is hard to wash off. And what is the impact on the microbiome of antibiotics in um, um, at farm animals? So to produce larger amounts, we are putting compounds in our system. And then the use of uh, other pesticides, such as Roundup, we know that glycophosphate is an incredibly toxic substance and uh, myogenic. So I whether these are contributing somewhat to uh, episode, and how do we look at that? Because um, how do you teach people lifestyle modifications in learning how to So I don't have any specific data in, uh, in pesticides, although I'm sure they play a role. Um, the, I think the biggest driver of the worldwide this global epidemic and on our health and liver disease is simply a Western diet. Carbohydrates, uh, you mentioned fructose, sugars in almost everything, the promotion of a sedentary lifestyle. People. Um, if you look at one of the slides I had, the Middle East um, having one of the highest prevalence, and they have the highest incidence of sedentary lifestyle, and that's because they have so much money. Um, but um, it's really excess, what causes uh, non alcoholic fat in liver disease is really excess fat accumulation in the liver. Excess fat is actually the toxin, or the toxicity that drives NASH or drives inflammation. So, too many, you have a few fat cells, you have many, 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 many fat cells, and you get endoplasmic reticulum stress. They start to, you have mitochondrial dysfunction, you have production cytokines, which activates stellate cells, and that's when you get fibrosis, and you progress, progress, progress. There are lots of patients that have not that have a fatty liver that are actually fine. They don't have any elevated liver enzymes that are, that are totally fine. Uh, you want me to mention why the incidence in African Americans, um, African Americans have fatty liver, but they tend to less fatty liver, they tend to progress to cirrhosis and non-alcoholic GL hepatitis at a lower rate than other groups, and it's felt to be a bit just the PNLP3 in real Hispanics is because of genetics. Frank, I wish I had been listening to your talk, I would have felt slightly better about myself about a sedentary physician here. Yeah. If you can give some advice in primary care and those who are in internal medicine, uh, we tell everybody that the baby boomers need to have their health C antibody checked. We have guidelines out there about to and when to get LFTs or how to screen. And what would your recommendations be to the folks who are, are in the these patients who come in for their annual checkup? Uh, or less than annual checkup, and there's a concern for fatty liver. How should they be handled? Okay, so I'll tell you that officially, um, the guidelines do not screening uh, of patients either in primary care or specialty practice for uh, fatty liver disease. Both those guidelines, so there are no guidelines. The reason for that is we don't know what to do with the implications treatments. Are you screening this huge population? On the other hand, if you have patients who, and you will have patients who come in and who have right quadrant pain, who 
we get an ultrasound, and all of a sudden the ultrasound comes back with fatty liver. Um, if it is, if that patient has uh, an echogenic liver and has absolutely no rise in liver enzymes, has absolutely not does not have central obesity, uh, does not have any things that would be considered uh, with the metabolic syndrome, then those patients really should be referred to uh, one of our colleagues in, in, in our division. We'd be happy to see them. Uh, because it's, it's hard to distinguish those ketosis. Actual non alcoholic fatty liver disease means a risk for progression. These patients, and you're concerned if they have elevated liver enzymes, certainly we should see them. If you have, if you look at their medication profile and see that they're on steatogenic medications, thyroid, they have polycystic ovarian disease, they clearly have other reasons. Uh, to, to hit uh, as, uh, as the, the root cause of liver disease, and you should look in that direction to all those patients. Um, although they're guideline that they should be screened, so you shouldn't be screening these patients. Endocrinologists, those who deal with patients with type 2 diabetes and those with the metabolic syndrome, those patients with advanced liver disease, those patients for sure. Uh, I'm at Roosevelt. Ask a question. Of course. I would like to um, understand better uh, when you order a fibro scan, uh, the non-specificity of the fatty liver uh, on an ultrasound uh, always bothers me. Uh, I see a lot of patients who have metabolic syndrome and uh, slightly elevated liver enzymes uh, drink a little bit of alcohol, but don't qualify for in, in any way. And I wonder which patients uh, I should order a fibro scan. So, uh, thank you for that question. So, I think that in your particular situation where you're dealing with patients with metabolic syndrome type 2 diabetes, they should probably all get fibro scan. The reason for that is the fibro scan not only gives you a more accurate the amount of fat, but it also gives you a fibrosis score. And so what you're really concerned about in these patients is developing of fibrosis. Um, and ultrasound alone will only give you an idea of the fat content. Uh, not the patient is developing fibrosis, and fibrosis is a stigma that NASH and may need to be treated uh, much more aggressively. Another thing to keep in mind with your patients with metabolic is that hepatocellular carcinoma, just like in hepatitis B when it occurs, does not. And um, I think in the patients, if you're dealing with a lot of patients with non alcoholic fatty liver disease, one of you are going to, although it's not in the guidelines, I suspect in the near guidelines will actually uh, hepatocellular carcinoma once non alcoholics develop it. Thank you.